And we're going to talk about the resurrection today. Say resurrection. resurrection. And I want to dive into a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that brings some uh, hard-hitting, transformational truth into your life. I think we've got way too much feel good about yourself, light, fluffy messaging. Like for how many of you, your favorite Easter candy was Peep's Marshmallow? Right? This is like sugar and air, right? How many little more substantial like Reese's peanut butter eggs or like the Cadbury cream filled eggs, something like that? My absolute favorite Easter candy is brisket. Uh, <laughs> something meaty and substantial. And that's kind of what I want to bring today in terms of a message is something meaty and substantial that will change your life if you understand it, change your relationships, change the very trajectory of how you're living. And so if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to 1 Corinthians 15. If you've got a phone, Google 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 20 here this morning. Verses 12 through 20. This is going to tell us everything we need to know about the resurrection and why it should matter to us to know it. So here we go. It says, Now if Christ is preached that he is risen from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Say empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he, in, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead. So I want to talk about what is the resurrection and why does it matter? Uh, I start, did kind of a, an informal poll, asked a bunch of people this week to explain the resurrection to me. What is the resurrection? And surprisingly, no one could do it. They said it happened. Oh, Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, something about being dead and coming back to life, but never got a real crisp answer. So I want to give you uh, just a, a quick explanation of what is the resurrection, so, first of all, Jesus' resurrection is the greatest event in history. Say greatest event. This trumps the incarnation as hard as that is to, to fathom that God becoming man. Uh, this is actually more substantial. I think we should change the dating system from when Christ was born to when Christ was raised from the dead. That's the real turning point in history for all of us. That's the de definitive moment. And I want to talk about some historical facts surrounding Jesus' resurrection. There are some kind of indisputable facts about the resurrection that we should all be aware of. First one is, is that Jesus was killed by crucifixion at the hands of the Romans. All scholars recognize that, that Jesus was an actual historical figure, and the Romans crucified him. Jesus was buried in a tomb that was guarded by Roman soldiers. Another fact surrounding the resurrection. Jesus' tomb was found empty three days later. No corpse was ever discovered. They've got no body of Jesus, no bones to go visit. Uh, there's no body of Jesus that was ever found. All of Jesus' disciples believed that they saw the resurrected Jesus. That's an indisputable fact of historians. They all believed they saw the resurrected Jesus. And their lives were transformed as a result. They went from being these terrified deserters, these fearful followers, into these bold, fearless 
witnesses that turned the Roman Empire upside down in a hundred years. Many of them were martyred, refusing to recant their faith in the resurrection, even though it cost them their life. Jesus' brother James, uh, who was unbelieving, believed that he saw the resurrected Savior, and he converted to become a follower of Jesus. Paul, the early church persecutor, also believed that he saw the risen Jesus and converted to Christianity. And all the Gospels wrote about the resurrection, and the church has unanimously and consistently taught the resurrection of Jesus for over 2,000 years. Those are just the facts. Uh, whether you believe it or not, those are the, the undisputed facts about the resurrection. Now, here's the big idea about the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection defeats death for all who trust in him. This isn't just about Jesus rising from the dead. This is about Jesus defeating death. Say defeating death. Right? We have this phrase, cheating death. Anybody ever heard that phrase, cheating death? Jesus doesn't need to cheat death because he defeated death. And this is what it, we saw in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus. Gee, the resurrection is proof that all our sins are, have been fully paid for. What do I mean by that? Paul tells us that the, the consequences of sin is death. That's what you get for sinning. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Say death. All right? So Jesus took all our sins upon himself and died on the cross for them on our behalf. Say on my behalf. All right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that very clearly, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus actually became our sin, took all of our sin, took it to the cross, died in our place to pay for it in full. How do we know it was paid in full? How do we know you didn't sin so much that you've exceeded your you know, you're, you're streaming sin minutes and now you're, you're, you've been, you're being charged by God in eternity and you got to go to purgatory or do some kind of special penance to make up for your extra sin. Remember, what's the wages of sin? Death. Jesus took our sins on himself and died for them. There can only be no more death if there's no more sin. Make sense? Pretty logical, because the wages of sin is what? Death. If, you're, if your sin was still being accounted for, Jesus couldn't have rose from the dead because he took your sin on himself. His resurrection proves that your sins have been paid in full. Another thought about the resurrection. Jesus was the first person to rise from the dead, never to die again. Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now, do you know that if you're familiar with the gospel stories, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? What about him? Well, there's an idea here. Jesus, well, and I'll get to that in the, in the next slide, but before we do that, Jesus didn't just rise from the dead. Jesus is the resurrection. Look what he said to Martha, or to Mary in, uh, in no, it was Martha in John eleven twenty five through twenty six. He said to her, "I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die." Do you believe this? So here's this idea that Jesus says, "I'm not just going to rise from the dead." I am the resurrection. What does that mean? By defeating death, Jesus secures eternal life for everyone who believes in him. Apart from Jesus, 
there is no resurrection and there is no eternal life. This is key to understand that without Jesus, there is no resurrection. He is the resurrection and the life. There's no, etern- there's no resurrection apart from him. Now, resurrection isn't just resuscitation. And this is important. It's not just coming back to life. Right, resuscitation happens. It's a temporary recovery to life that was known. It's the same life you had. I don't know, anybody ever flatline and get brought back? No? My father-in-law did that on our front, uh, front walkway. The, he had a heart attack, and the paramedics came, and he was talking to me. He's like, I'm fine, I'm fine. They're like, no, sir, we're going to take you in anyway. Out to the ambulance, boom, he just, just heart stops. And uh, so they, you know, tell us to stay back. They get working on him. They zap him. He comes back, Italian man cursing. Um, But uh, he was resuscitated, even though he technically died, his heart stopped beating. He was not resurrected because, but six, seven years later, he died again. So it wasn't resurrection. It's not resuscitation. Resuscitation involves Uh, medical, sometimes a miraculous intervention, but it doesn't alter the fundamental nature of your existence. You are still going to die even if you've been resuscitated. Even though Jesus brought Lazarus back to life, it wasn't his resurrection because Lazarus died again. Resurrection is receiving an entirely new an eternal life. Say entirely new. Say eternal. This is the power of the resurrection. It's a it's a, a new birth to a new, completely brand new life in Jesus. It will be inconceivably glorious. First Corinthians two nine says, "What no eye has seen, no ear has heard." what hasn't even entered into the mind of man, these are the things that God's prepared for those who love him. Talking about this new, eternal, glorious life in Christ after the resurrection. We're also told that we'll be transformed. We'll receive a brand new body. I played racquetball yesterday, and Nan was giving me a hard time saying I'm getting older because I'm icing my shoulder afterwards, right? And One day, I'm not going to have to ice my shoulder because I'm going to get a new heavenly body that will not experience pain or suffering or sorrow or any of those things. Once you've been resurrected, you will never die again. That's the power of the resurrection. Once you are resurrected, you'll never die again. Now, Jesus' resurrection is the foundation for our faith. Say foundation. A lot of people think that the cross is the foundation for our faith, but it's not. It's actually the resurrection. Without the resurrection, Paul told us in the verses we read, Christianity is an empty religion. Look at, let's read it again. It says, now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. Notice Paul didn't say that about the cross. He said that about the resurrection. This is the foundation for our faith. This is the key thing that you have to accept and believe to have genuine faith. Without the resurrection, Christianity is useless. It's an empty religion, but thank be to God, Jesus did rise. And Acts 1-3 tells us that he not only rose, but he presented himself alive for many days with many infallible proofs. All right, so Jesus' resurrection is the proofs that God's word can be trusted. This is, again, why it's so important that we talk about the resurrection. The Bible is full of prophecies about the resurrection. I don't know if you're aware of that. God is the first one that hinted at it to Adam in Genesis 3. 
Job prophesied that he would see his Redeemer in the flesh after he was dead. Uh, G David prophesied of the resurrection in multiple psalms. Isaiah prophesied Jesus' resurrection. Abraham offering Isaac was foreshadowing the resurrection. Jonah, Jesus said, was a sign of his resurrection. Jesus himself prophesied many times that he would be killed, and three days later he would rise again. By rising from the dead, Jesus proved the scriptures all true. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we would have to doubt the Bible because it makes these incredible, audacious claims that the Son of God would come, live a perfect life, take our sin, be crucified, died, and then rise again three days later. That's insane, right? If, that, if, if it's not God saying it, you'd have to say that's crazy. But Jesus proved all the scriptures true. Why is that important? Because you can trust God's word. This is the key. You can trust God's word. When you read it, and it says something, you can know that it's true, and you can bank your life on it. Now, Jesus' resurrection also secures our forgiveness. We hinted at this a little earlier, but let's, let's go over it. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, say we're stuck in sin. Say like, like uh-oh, right? Say we're stuck in sin, right? And this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. See how the resurrection is the cornerstone for our faith? This is the important thing to grasp. It's not just that Jesus died on the cross. It's that he rose from the dead after dying on the cross. Jesus is re was resurrected to make us right with God. And again, I'm not sure why we hammer the idea of the cross so heavily and neglect the resurrection. Romans 4, 24 through 25 says, God will count us righteous if we believe in, the one, in him, the one who raised Jesus from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. The resurrection is what makes you right with God. It's not just about having your sins forgiven. It's about being made right with God. 1 John 1, 9 says, Then if we confess our sins, God's faithful and he's just, and he'll forgive us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. We have that confidence because Jesus rose from the dead. All right, Jesus' resurrection also gives us hope for eternal life. This is one of my favorite parts. This is what, look what uh, Paul said. When we, when we trust Jesus, we are born again into a living hope. This is what he said, if Christ is not raised, all who have died believing in Christ are lost, and if our hope is only for this life, not eternal life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Now, you guys know my mom died uh, last October, and I have hope, I have a living hope that she is not dead, that she is alive because of the resurrection. I don't have wishful thinking. I have living hope because Jesus rose from the dead. 1 Peter 1.3 says he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is where our hope comes from, the resurrection. Hope that death is not the end of our existence. Say death is not the end. Turn to someone and say, death is not your end, right? Hope that we will be raised to eternal life with Jesus. Hope that believers like my mom who have died are alive with Jesus right now, 
right? They're alive with Jesus right now. And then the hope is that we're all going to be reunited together with Jesus forever. The resurrection is what gives us that hope. That's the guarantee that we're going to be resurrected if we put our trust and our faith in Jesus. Gee, we're getting towards the end here. I know, kids, you've been super patient because this is not light and fluffy stuff. Um, Jesus assures us of our salvation. How many of you would like to be assured of your salvation? The cross doesn't assure you of salvation. The resurrection assures you of salvation. That's where our anchor is. Look at what it says. We are assured that we're saved from sin that separates us from God. We've already talked about this, that the resurrection is the proof that your sin has been paid in full. Say paid in full. Turn to someone, especially if you've got a spouse here, and say, say your sin's paid in full. <laughs> All right, sometimes we need to be reminded of that. God forgives us in full when we put our full faith in Jesus because Jesus paid it all. I love that we sang that song right before the message. Jesus paid it all, not most, not some, not the majority. He paid it all, and the resurrection is proof that it's all been paid. We're assured that we're saved into an eternal relationship with God. So Jesus' resurrection opens the door into a right relationship with God. And I can't stress this enough. This is the whole point of being a Christian is to be in a relationship with God. The cross just clears you of your guilt, but it doesn't open a relationship with God. The resurrection is what ushers us into a new life in relationship with right with God, considered as righteous as Jesus. God reconciles us to himself when we receive the gift of his grace. So what must we do to be saved? This is a question I get all the time. What do I have to do to actually be saved? Being saved is about whom you trust for this life and eternity. Now, I worded this carefully. A lot of times we think that salvation is about believing a certain set of biblical principles. I want you to realize the Bible says the devil believes and he trembles. The devil believes all the biblical principles that most uh, Christian preachers say you have to believe in order to be saved. It's not about believing principles from the Bible. It's about trusting in the one who wrote those principles in the Bible. It's about trusting your life to the one who set these principles out, who came and, uh, well, we'll go through it. <clears throat> Acts 16, 31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It doesn't say believe about the Lord Jesus. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice it doesn't say if you believe Jesus died on the cross. It says you've got to believe God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. So will you trust Jesus with your whole heart? That's my question to you today. Will you trust Jesus with your whole heart? And this, yeah, I love it. I love it. All right? They do a great job back there in kids' ministry. And parents, you do a great job with your kids, uh, telling them how much God loves them. All right? Because that's what we want. We want that it's not just a, a, a religious set of ideas that I agree to, but it's a person that I'm entrusting my life to. So, will you trust that God loved you so much that he sent his son to live a perfect life on your behalf and take your sins to the cross 
and die for them in your place. Will you trust that? Will you trust that God loved you that much? That if you were the only person on the planet, he would have sent his son to die for you. No. No. You do. You want to. I know it's a, that's a, we don't want Jesus to die, so I, I hear you on that. And that's great, great heart. Because then we know that Jesus didn't just die on the cross for us. He also rose from the dead. So will you trust that Jesus rose from the dead after three days and defeated death? Will you trust that? Will you trust that his resurrection proves that your sins are paid in full? Yes. And there's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to make up for. You simply have to trust in his completed work on the cross. Will you trust that? Will you trust that God forgives you and accepts you fully because of what Jesus did? Not because of what you do. Your forgiveness and acceptance is not based on your merit. It's based on Jesus's merit. It's based on what he did for you. Will you trust that and let go of trying to make up for all your own shortcomings? Yeah? All right. We got a bunch of saved kids in the front row. Will you trust Jesus? Here's the hard part. Will you trust Jesus enough to surrender to his will for your life? It means you got to stop living for yourself. It means you can't have your own agenda for your life. It means you get up every day and you say, Jesus, what do you want for my life? And if you can do that, will you trust Jesus to guide and direct your life from this day forward? Will you do that? All right, we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to have Jared come back up. Is Jared around? Jared. Jared, there he is. So this is what you must do to be saved. Don't take my slides away yet. Don't take my slides away. They took my slides away. I'm not done. I just want Jared up. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Let me get my slides back really quick. All right, I know that for some of you, the resurrection hasn't been on your radar. And it's not your fault. Christianity has been watered down in our culture, and we're taught it's about church. You know, our vision here at the gathering is that everyone's life here would overflow with Jesus. Our vision is not that this building would overflow with people. That's way too small of a vision. We don't want this place to overflow with people because that's not the sign of our success. The sign of success in Christ is that your life overflows with the reality of Jesus every single day. That it's his love that beats in your heart. That it's his joy that fills you. It's his peace that guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, no matter what's happening in your life, no matter how difficult things are going. It's that your hope wouldn't be that you'll make it through this week, this month, this year, but that your hope would be anchored in eternity with a God who loves you so much that he would give his one and only son to set you free from your sin and bring you into a relationship with him. And so I know that there are some that have been going to church, maybe even been coming to the gathering for a while, and you have never really understood what it means to be saved, to trust Jesus with your whole life, not just to believe a set of biblical truths, but to entrust your life 
fully and completely to the one who lived on your behalf, who died on the cross for your sins, and rose again so that you could experience that same new life. So that you would never have to worry about dying ever again. And so I want to give you an opportunity, if you've never squared that with God, and you've never expressed and confessed with your mouth that I give my life to Jesus, that's what it means to confess Jesus as Lord. Not to say He's Lord, but to surrender to His guiding and controlling of your life to say, Jesus, you're in control. You run this ship. You be the boss. I'm going to follow you and I'm going to seek you uh, for your guidance and direction every single day. So I want to, in this closing moments, I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never prayed and surrendered your life to Jesus and trusted him fully, maybe you've just been doing a religious thing, maybe you think you're a good person, but good isn't good enough. God requires perfection, that's why he had to send Jesus, because only Jesus could live the perfect life we never could. And he offers to give us that credit for his life if we'll entrust ours to him. So let's bow our hearts, and let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that you didn't just send your son to die on the cross for us. You raised him from the dead, defeating death, doing away with all of our sin once and for all, opening the door so that we could come into a real personal relationship with you. And Father, I pray for those who uh, this is a new idea of entrusting their whole life to you trusting you to be the solution to their greatest problem, sin. Trusting you to be their eternal hope. Trusting you to be their strength and their guidance in this life right now. Father, I pray that you would cause the light to go on in their hearts. You would cause faith to spring up and sprout in their hearts to say, I trust Jesus. I trust in his death and resurrection for me. If that's you today, I want to lead you in a prayer. And it's not, again, it's not the words of the prayer that save you. It's your heart trusting Jesus fully. That's what saves you. So if you want to put your trust in Jesus this morning, pray this prayer in the, in the, the quietness of your heart with full assurance. Say, Jesus, I believe you came and you lived for me. And I believe that you took my sins and died on the cross for them. And I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe you defeated death. I believe that you paid for all my sins in full. And so I trust you today. I trust you to forgive me for all my sins. I trust you to bring me into a relationship with your Father. I trust you to give me a new and eternal life. I trust that you love me. And I give my life to you now forever. Be my Lord, be the boss of my life. Guide me and direct me from today onward. If you prayed that prayer this morning, while every head's still bowed and eyes are closed, you just raise your hand up so I can remember you in prayer. God bless you. 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 God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Father, thank you for all these hands that have gone up this morning, all these hearts that have gone up in trust to you, and I pray that you would give them deep assurance of their salvation today, that they can trust you, you have done it all, and that you have welcomed them into your family, you've forgiven them their sins, their 
good with you. They're in a right relationship with you. I pray you'd fill them with your Holy Spirit. We trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One last thing as we, as we close the service. Jesus' resurrection brings us into an entirely new life. Bible says that because of the resurrection, we should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4 says we were buried with him, therefore, by baptism into death, in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's the glory coming out of the resurrection. That's the glory out of trusting in Jesus is that we would get to walk in that same power of the resurrection that raised Jesus from the dead. What does that look like? A new life means new priorities and new routines. And this is going to be for those of you that just accepted Jesus, put your trust in him, and for those that have maybe put your trust in him but forgot what it means to walk in this newness of life, forgot what it means to walk in the truth of the resurrection. So it starts by telling others of your decision to trust Jesus. If you raise your hand today, turn to the person next to you and say, I trusted Jesus today. In fact, everybody turn to someone. If you trusted Jesus, say, I trusted Jesus today. <laughs> awesome. This is the joy and the faith we should have about talking about our faith. We're not buying into a weird religion, we're trusting in the only one who can save us from our sin and bring us into a glorious eternity. This really is the best news ever, and we should be eager and bold to tell people that I trust Jesus. And then pray for God's help and guidance and strength daily. I want to encourage you, if you don't do this regularly, just say, get up in the morning and say, God, I need your help. In fact, let's try that together. Say, God, I need your help. That's the best prayer you can ever pray because uh, it's honest and it gets to the point. All right, God, I need your help with whatever's going on. Guide me, give me your strength daily. Then start reading God's word. We listen to so much propaganda, so much false thinking. The Bible is where God put his truth down in writing so we could have access to it at any time. Stop trusting Google and chat GPT and start going to the creator of the universe every day. Right? Keep learning and growing Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, we're actually taking a break for a month, but then we're going to start up with a a new series called Stress-Free Living, how to live a life without any stress. So if you have any stress, Wednesdays, uh, 6 p.m., uh, starting first Wednesday of May, uh, be a great series for you to come to. It's just a four-week series. If you've never gotten baptized, I want to encourage you to get baptized. Our, our next baptism is June 16th. Say June 16th. If baptism is a about declaring I'm all in with Jesus. It's, it's identifying with his death and resurrection. And then start building Jesus-based friendships. Say Jesus-based friendships. Man, Monday, uh, the first, second Monday of the month, May 8th, uh, we're going to have a, our second annual epic chili cook-off challenge. Uh, so... I am uh, excited about that. Um, the ladies are having their spring brunch. I don't think it'll be as epic as our chili cook-off, but I'm sure they've got like cucumber sandwiches and fun stuff like that. Um, and then join the church. Our next member, new members class is May 18th. So these are all the ways that we start to build a new routine to embrace this new life in Christ. So let's stand and let's uh, close with a, a song, a celebration for the resurrection today and all that Jesus has done for us.